acceptance of the last lecture and we had also discussed about uh, application of work energy method by writing the total mechanical energy of oscillation as a sum of kinetic energy and potential energy term and then expressing uh, the derivative of that the time derivative of the work energy relation or the conservation of mechanical energy relation which brings us to the simple harmonic motion equation again so if we differentiate the potential energy plus kinetic energy is equal to constant equation if we differentiate it with respect to time so that is supposed to give us the uh, you know it's supposed to give us the SHM equation. So let's continue the discussion from that point. And of course, uh, we will do some more practice examples of SHM of spring mass systems. And then we will move on to the second part of this uh, oscillations chapter that is from simple harmonic motion to angular harmonic motion. So from linear systems to angular systems, where basically we are talking about pendulums that have angular displacement, which is a to and fro motion with respect to a stable equilibrium point. So, anyhow, let's uh, begin. We had also, I think, seen one example of how to incorporate rolling into uh, a situation of simple harmonic motion. A rolling cylinder attached to springs. Okay, how it can perform, its center of mass will perform a to and fro motion, which is simple harmonic. So those kind of things also. We'll look at a couple of examples today. So first of all, we will start with some variation of spring mass systems where there is combination of springs. Okay. So SHM of spring mass systems. And this can be a horizontal or a vertical, but basically there's a combination of multiple springs. So of course the simple case is when there is a series of parallel type of combination. So we can reduce it to an equivalent single spring. So series combination of springs is a combination that looks like this. When we have two individual springs which are connected end to end, which are of constant K1 and K2. So what we can see is that if we stretch this combination, To a situation like this, where we are using some kind of external force. Because both of them are stretched. So this is the junction point of the two springs. So let's say the first one had a natural length L1, it is extended by X1. The second one had a natural length L2, it is extended by X2. So we can see that overall, if the system had a natural length, which was L1 plus L2, now this system is stretched out by L plus X. So we'll see that X is equal to X1 plus X2, and F is equal to T2, which is equal to T1. So. So now from this, we can develop the relationship between this we've done in this thing before. Okay. So we can see from here, we have X1 is to X2 is K2 is to K1. And X1 plus X2 is equal to X. So X1 is K2 upon K1 plus K2 X. And X2 is equal to K1 upon K1 plus K2 X and F which is equal to K2 X2 becomes K2 into K1 upon K1 plus K2 X. So it becomes F is equal to the equivalent spring constant into X. And by comparison of this with this, you can see that the equivalent spring constant becomes K1 K2 upon 
k1 plus k2 okay so for this kind of series combination of two springs we can say that this system is equivalent to a single spring system which has an equivalent spring constant given by this relation so this is something that ideally you should be familiar from work energy and because of equilibrium no? this is a situation where there is equilibrium so if you look at the equilibrium of this point here the, the junction point let's say p1 and the junction point p2 where the other okay so from so this is coming from free body diagram of these massless points p1 and p2 the net force at these two points should be zero okay shikhar hope that is clear okay so anyhow so if we generalize this okay just make a quick note of this and we will we'll generalize and see that if we have n number of springs which are in series combination then also like uh, we can come up with a similar kind of formula for the equivalent spring constant okay so a slightly more convenient way of uh, you know going about these equations especially if we have more than two springs which are in series combination is that you know this equation we have k1 x1 is equal to k2 x2 and you have that is f is equal to k1 x1 this combination of equations and you have x is equal to x1 plus x2 so when you solve this system here f should be equal to k equivalent into x so 
एफ अपॉन के इक्वेलेंट इज इक्वल टू एक्स वेर एफ अपॉन के इक्वेलेंट इज इक्वल टू एक्स वन प्लस एक्स टू and then if you incorporate this over here or you solve these two equations so you basically get that you know uh, x1 is equal to k2 upon k1 plus k2 x and x2 is equal to k1 upon k1 plus k2 x so you have this equation that you know this kind of equation so from that basically what you get is that 1 upon k equivalent or actually directly from here also you can see that 1 upon k equivalent is 1 by k1 plus 1 by k2 this is another way of remembering this formula that inverse of the equivalent spring constant is the sum of the inverse of the individual spring constants k1 and k2 सर की हमें सर कांस्टेंट लिखना आ रहा है सॉरी आई एम नॉट एबल टू हियर यू क्लियरली बेटर व्हाट डिड यू से दिस इज 1 बाय k इक्वलेंट 1 बाय k1 प्लस 1 बाय k2 यस इट इज जस्ट लाइक द फार्मूला फॉर पैरेलल कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ रेजिस्टेंस okay so if we now generalize this we will get uh, this kind of relation we have n number of springs which are in series combination like this one after the other so k1 k2 k3 going up to kn this whole combination is being pulled with some external force so there is tension in each of these springs which will be all equal from the free body diagram of each of the junction points you can see this thing that t1 is equal to t2 is equal to tension in the nth spring which is equal to f so therefore mm -hmm. we have the relation that x1 the k1 x1 is equal to k2 x2 is equal to like this going up to kn xn is equal to f okay and now x1 plus x2 plus this should be equal to x where this f should be equal to k equivalent into x so from this equation now we can see that k1 x1 is equal to k2 x2 like this equal to k equivalent into x where now this is the relation so from the first equation we can see that from this equation let's call this equation 1 from equation 1 we can see that x1 is to x2 is equal to or if we do this whole you know combination x1 is to x2 is to x3 like that going up to x n it is 1 by k1 is to 1 by k2 is to 1 by k3 like this going up to so then so now solving this equation by substituting this over here we will get the relation that 1 upon k equivalent is equal to 1 by k1 plus 1 by k2 like this or the general formula for series combination 
वन अपॉन इक्वेलेंट स्प्रिंग कॉन्स्टेंट इज समेशन ऑफ वन बाई के फॉर ऑल द स्प्रिंग्स वॉट एवर द नंबर ऑफ स्प्रिंग्स this is the general formula for n number of springs in series ultimately this is the one that becomes most important for us in the case of the two springs is just the one which is a special case of this Okay, I'll scroll up.
Okay, so Shikhar and Jagannath, hope you're done with this now. Okay, now let's move on to the next part, which is parallel combination of strings. That's the easy one. The equivalent string constant just becomes the sum. So for example, you can have a situation where, let's say, between two walls, a smooth floor is kind of connecting the two walls. There is an object kept with any number of springs which are attached like this. Like in my example, I'm taking, let's say, in all, I'm going to take five springs, but there could be any number of springs here. So suppose these are my five springs. And right now, all of them are in natural length. They all have the common natural length L. So all springs have common natural length of L. Now, if we disturb this uh, equilibrium position of the block, so there's the equilibrium position as you can see. Now, if we disturb the equilibrium position to either side, you will see that all the springs will apply restorative force. Because in this case, for example, these three would have got compressed and the other two would have got extended. So they'll try to restore themselves. So there'll be a net force on the block that will give it an acceleration in this direction. <clears throat> because if I move the block by distance X on this side, then these springs have got compressed. And these two springs here have got extended by exactly the same amount. So they will all apply tensions, which are like this. These will apply outward tensions because they are comp compressed and these will apply inward tensions because they're extended. So T1, T2, T3, same way if you do the other side also. Okay. So on the block, there is a net force of summation of T. Five in this case. Okay, so that is so the net force this particular case the sum of five into x. So that is our equivalent spring constant into x. So equivalent spring constant in any parallel combination becomes summation of k whatever the number of springs. And parallel combination doesn't always mean that the springs have to be on the same side. They can be on opposite sides also, like the ones I've shown you over here. Four and five are attached from the opposite side compared to one, two, and three. But they are having the same kind of action when the block is moved. They'll apply restorative force, which is proportional to X for each of the five springs. So they're in parallel combination. So this is the general formula. or n number of springs the parallel combination
okay people so hope this example is clear so let's look at an application question now again this is like a very simple type of question that uh, you may get at the je mains level because it's going to be direct formula based so for example if we have a situation like this we have three springs which are connected to a block like this and the given position is the equilibrium state of the block with all three springs in natural length condition this is the the block shown above is in the equilibrium position so given that k1 is equal to 6 newtons per centimeter k2 is equal to 3 newtons per centimeter and k3 is equal to 2 newtons per centimeter and the mass of the block is 1 kg we want to find the time period of its shm if it is displaced from equilibrium displaced horizontally and released assume the floor is frictionless frictionless smooth surface okay so just just work out this question quickly it's very very easy what you have to do in this is reduce the combination of springs to a single spring mass system and then you don't have to do any derivation just use the formula for time period of a regular spring mass system okay very good uh, samarth your answer is correct uh, devansh your answer is also correct very good and also dhruv very good 
so let's uh, check this out very simple so first step what you do is you reduce this combination to a single spring and the next step you can you know you can do it as a like two step process so you can see here that this and this are in series combination so let's say that is giving us a single spring of equivalent spring constant k prime so that is k upon k1 plus k2 so that k prime should become 2 newtons per centimeter so now your system is reduced to this so this is equivalent to this where this is k prime this is k and now this and this are in a parallel combination so equivalent spring constant will become the sum of the two so that will become 4 newtons per centimeter so now this further is equivalent to a single spring which you can place on either side it doesn't really matter so it has an equivalent spring constant of that much so the time period will become 2 pi under root m upon k equivalent which is 1 kg divided by 4 into 10 raised to power 2 newton per meter when you convert in si units so it will become pi by 10 seconds or approximately 0.314 seconds okay. so that is the time period so very simple type of direct question so even if this was a vertical system it would have been the same thing okay only the equilibrium position would not have been x equal to 0 it would have been where the springs have a bit of deformity and the weight is balanced by the combination of spring force but otherwise it's the same okay so so for example if we have a system like this where three springs are like this then here in this example also the uh, time period of vertical oscillation would have become 2 pi under root m upon k equivalent which would have become 2 pi under root m into 1 by k1 plus 1 by k2 plus 1 by k3 okay. and at equilibrium k1 x1 would be equal to k2 x2 would be equal to k3 x Three, which would be equal to mg. So each of the springs would have this much of extension at equilibrium. Basically, this would be reduced to a single equivalent spring. so these are examples of your direct application of parallel and series combination sorry come again okay.
okay very good jagannath okay so now let's see examples where there's a combination of springs which is neither series nor parallel other types of combinations so now for example if we have like a particle which is attached to a combination of three springs like this one spring is here but the other two springs they are connected symmetrically with respect to this let's say x axis so these two springs are of same constant k1 also this is our of a different constant k2 so this diagram is the system is on a smooth horizontal surface which is our xy plane so gravity is going into the plane in this diagram okay so acceleration due to gravity is minus gk cap like this going into the plane and the body m is at equilibrium at the position shown now if given a small displacement delta x along the x axis show that it will perform shm and find its time period okay. you don't need to write down the whole question just the understand the diagram of the question and take down the data of the question and we'll work on it now so the hint that i'll give you here is that uh, <clears throat> we will use a constraint relation equation we will use constraint relation equation so let's say k1 is given to us as 5 newtons per centimeter and that angle theta is 37 degrees and k2 <coughs> it's given us uh, given to us as um, 6 newtons per centimeter or let's say it's given to us as 8 newtons per centimeter the mass of the block is once again 1 kg so we have to find the time period numerically <clears throat> so the key here is that it is given a small displacement delta x along the x axis so there is not only symmetry but the displacement being small the angle theta will not change very much okay. so we have to understand from fundamentals what kind of net force will act on the spring and from that we will solve the question for the so just give it a small displacement on either side from the equilibrium position along the x axis and try to calculate the net restorative force acting on it okay assuming that the displacement is small enough yes k2 is equal to 8 jagannath that's correct 8 newtons per centimeter
<clears throat> yes, very good. Devanch and Parsh, that's correct. Yeah, the angle is 37 degrees. Better. It's not 39 degrees, it's 37 degrees. Okay, so what is slightly tricky here to understand <clears throat> is the constraint relation. So I will just represent this with a diagram of lines first without drawing the actual springs. So what we'll see is that if this is the equilibrium position, now suppose we displace this to this position by delta x. Okay. Then what happens to these two springs is that their length increases by a slightly different amount compared to what happens to this third spring. So if this one had a natural length of L2, on displacing this by delta x, this has got compressed to L2 minus delta x. But if these two had a natural length each, of L1 and L1. Now they are stretched by a slightly different amount. This is L1 plus delta X prime, let's say. This is also L1 plus delta X prime. So we have to find, first of all, find the relation between delta X and delta X prime. What is that relation? That's the first thing we have to find. Then only we can draw the force diagram. Okay. Assuming that delta x is small compared to L1 and L2. Okay. So that is where you need to understand the geometry of one of these triangles. This triangle, say this is L1, this is h, and this is x. So you can see that L1 is equal to X sec theta. So now X stretches by a small amount delta X. Then L1 will stretch by a slightly different one. Just that this relation will hold. So if for small delta x, theta is constant. So delta L1 is equal to delta x into sec theta. And delta L1 is nothing but delta x prime. So this is the relation between these two.
Oh, wait a minute, people. This, uh, this is not correct. Okay, I just need to make a correction here. We will use this constraint in a slightly different way because theta is variable. So you will not use this directly. I'll show you how to use theta also, but we'll use Pythagoras theorem instead. Now here, what is happening? H is fixed, it's constant. X and L1 are increasing. So they are increasing such that X becomes X plus delta X. So L1 becomes L1 plus delta l1 okay as that point moves by delta x this is what happens okay so we'll use this relation that if h is fixed the relation between x and l1 is that l1 square is equal to h square plus x square so now differentiate both the sides so Now, H is a constant, so this will just be. So we can say that L1 dL1 is equal to X dX. So for small change, L1 into delta L1 is approximately equal to X into delta X for small delta x. Okay. So we have actually this relation that delta L1 or what we have written as delta x prime is equal to x upon L1 times delta x. So it's actually the opposite relation that delta x prime is delta x cos theta. This is a constraint relation. So this is like a lengthy way of doing the constraint relation. I'll show you the shortcut method also of working this out. So that's basically the constraint relation. So that constraint relation is here.
okay so now we'll come to the free body diagram of that object when it is at that position i'll tell you we can use the theta part also but theta is variable so we'll have to take that into account okay so the spring to the left was compressed now so it will apply a force towards the right like this which will be that k2 delta x okay whereas these two springs were stretched out so they will apply force k1 delta x prime okay. and k1 delta x prime which are both symmetric so there will be an acceleration for the block which will be towards this direction so we'll have two k1 delta x prime cos theta plus k2 delta x is equal to mass into acceleration now we'll use a constraint relation that is delta x prime is equal to delta x cos theta so the constraint so we'll substitute that over here this equation will become 2k1 cos square theta plus k2 into delta x is equal to m so this is now like an equivalent spring constant into x is equal to ma where x is actually delta x it's a small displacement okay. so can we call it e dx or instead of delta x no to get the shm equation we need to relate it with x but keeping in mind that x is a small displacement okay so we have minus m d2x by dt square is equal to k equivalent into x but over here keeping in mind that for the condition that x is a small displacement so it's like a small delta x actually okay. so we'll have shm with time period equal to 2 pi under root m upon k equivalent now that k equivalent here you can see will become 2k1 cos square theta plus k2 so it is 2 into 5 into cos square 37 so that is 4 by 5 whole square because theta was 37 degrees okay plus k2 which was i think 8 right so it will become uh 16 by 25 So thirty-two by five, right? Six point four plus eight in newtons per centimeter. So it's becoming fourteen point four. Okay. Into ten raised part two in SI unit newton per meter. so let's do one thing let's take the mass also slightly different let's take the mass as 10 kg so that we'll get easy answer mass here or we can take the mass as smaller 100 grams let's take it as 0.1 kg Okay. So I'll show you the theta method also, but uh, that is going to be a little bit unnecessary. Better is I'll show you a constraint relation using the concept of approach and separation velocity, which you must have done in kinematics. Okay.
Okay, now I'm going to look at the constraint relation once more by a shortcut method. Okay. Okay, so as I said, a couple of more methods by which we can look at the constraint relation. So the easiest method in this type of case for constraint relation is the following, which I'm going to show you. By using approach and separation velocity concept. So if we have this junction point of three things which are of lengths L1, L1 and L2 and this angle is symmetrical, theta. Okay, so let's say this particle, I'm calling it the particle P, whereas these are three fixed points. So I'll call them A, B and C. Now let's give the particle a velocity along this direction towards C. So the particle P has a velocity P along the line PC. So what is happening? The approach velocity towards C, that is the approach velocity of the particle P towards C is directly V, okay. But also the separation velocity from A, let's say, okay. If this particle is moving with that velocity V such that that velocity is making an angle theta with this line, so how much it is how much is the instantaneous separation velocity with respect to a it's moving away from a na? so what is the separation velocity can you tell me how much it should be it's the component of v along the line ap na? so it should be v cos theta is this clear to all of us this is the component of its actual velocity v along the line EP. And similarly, the separation velocity from b is also the same. The instantaneous velocity of separation from b is also the same as v cos theta. So in a small time dt,
the length PC will change to L1 minus delta L1 or let's say DL1 and the length AP or BP will change to L2 plus DL2. Now in this, what will be the DL1? It will be the instantaneous approach velocity multiplied by time dt. But what will be the DL2? It will be the approach velocity, which is B cos theta into dt. So that is the relation between DL1 and dt. So if DL1 is my delta x and DL2 is delta x prime. So you can see that delta x prime is equal to delta x cos theta. So that is our constraint relation. So here I've taken a lot of exam time to write it down properly and explain it to you in detail the concept. But if you know this concept directly, you can just scribble it on the side and come up with a constraint relation within a few seconds. So it doesn't take that much time. Unlike the differentiation approach, which is time taking. So just make a note of this people I've explained for. Okay, so this is the easy method of the constraint relation. Now, another method is that using the angle, but that's a little bit lengthy because you will have to differentiate using the product rule actually. So if this is X, this is L, this is H. So if you use that kind of relation uh, that X is equal to L, cos theta. Now here x, l and theta, all three are variable. So dx by dt is equal to dl by dt into cos theta plus l into minus sine theta d theta by dt. So that is your relation that you know delta x is equal to delta l cos theta minus 
L sin theta into delta theta. Now we will also have to eliminate this term. This delta theta term needs to be eliminated. So how to eliminate that delta theta term? Now remember, h is fixed. Okay, so we have h is equal to l sine theta, or l is equal to h cosec theta. So when you differentiate this term, you have dl by dt is equal to so h into minus. Cosec theta cot theta into d theta by dt. So that is your relation now. That delta l is equal to minus h. I'll just write this like this. Cosec is one upon sine. Cot is cos upon sine into delta theta. So reverse this, and we can say that delta theta is equal to uh, minus h sine square theta upon cos theta into delta. L. So now we substitute that over here. So it becomes pretty lengthy, as you can see. So it becomes that delta x is equal to delta l cos theta. Minus l sine theta into this whole term now, so this will become plus finally, but square theta upon. Sir, h will be in the denominator. Upon h, yeah, 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 correct. That's what I was thinking. But ultimately, that will also get eliminated. Yeah, so h should be in the denominator. Rest of the things are correct, I think. Yes. So minus sine square theta upon cos theta delta L by H. Now again, you see what is this L by H? L by H is uh, one by sine theta. Yeah. So this will actually become delta L. If you take common, this will become cos theta plus sine cube theta. Upon cos theta into this term L by H, and L by H is nothing but cosec theta. Of course. Yeah. So, so you can see that you will get this relation: cos theta plus sine square upon cos. So when you take LCM, the numerator will just become one. So you get this relation. So it takes a lot of working. But you get the same conclusion that delta L, that is the change in length of the hypotenuse, is equal to delta x cos theta. So in our earlier thing, that delta L was only delta x prime, so that is equal to delta x cos theta. The change in the length of the hypotenuse that was delta x prime. So this is the other way of working out the constant relation. So as you can see, of the three methods, the third one is like probably the most uh, lengthy and unnecessary. Okay, the second one is the best one because you are not getting into any, uh, you know, geometrical constraint. You are just using the concept of approach and separation velocity. And uh, otherwise, even the first method is quite feasible. The third one is the one that becomes extra lengthy because you have to eliminate that delta theta term.
okay so that was that method and approach and separation velocity method this is the this method just take a look at it you really need not apply it Okay, so that is about these type of spring mass systems. Now we move on to next part, which is angular harmonic motion. Which is basically any pendulum kind of action where the angular displacement let's say theta from the mean position that is a stable equilibrium position is a harmonic function. So harmonic is another word for sinusoidal. Of time. So theta should be equal to some plus five where theta equal to zero is the mean position theta naught here is the maximum angular displacement so, so it's Just equivalent to uh, amplitude right yes so it is the angular amplitude Okay, sir.
Okay. Now rest of the things are same here. You can see that omega will be two pi upon time period or two pi f. So it is the angular frequency. Okay. In radians per second. Okay. Now this angular displacement or the angular amplitude, this will be in radians. The SI unit of angle is in radians. Okay. And similarly, the phase constant. Or initial phase. So this is also in radians. So once we get this, so we can see that therefore angular velocity d theta by dt becomes omega theta naught cos omega t plus phi. And angular acceleration d2 theta by dt squared come by double differentiating this. That's how the minus sign will come because you're differentiating cos. So once again, we have that dynamics condition that the acceleration and displacement are related by minus omega square. But this time the acceleration and displacement that we're talking about is not linear, but it is angular. So the angular acceleration should be proportionate to the angular displacement, but opposite in direction. When you compare this equation, this first one, angular displacement as a function of time with angular acceleration as a function of time. This one, you'll get that relation. Like the SHM equation, but there it was the relation between linear acceleration and linear displacement. Now it is the relation between angular acceleration and angular displacement. So therefore, d2 theta by dt square should be minus omega square theta. Or you can say that the net torque acting on the body will have to be minus k, some constant into theta. Because net torque is equal to I alpha. So this is net restorative torque in this case. I is moment of inertia. Basically, we will see that the dynamics equation becomes a rotational equation. Torque is equal to I alpha type of relation. So the dynamical condition for angular harmonic motion is that restorative torque is proportional to angular displacement. Just like over there we had restorative force was proportional to linear displacement. F net was equal to minus kx. F is equal to minus kx. Here we have the condition that the net restorative torque is minus k into theta. Of course here k will have different dimensions. K will have the dimension of torque because theta is dimensionless force into length or moment of inertia divided by square of time that kind of relation
Okay, so hope this part is clear. So now we will look at the most generic example of angular harmonic system, which is basically a physical pendulum. Physical pendulum. with small angular amplitude as an example of angular harmonic motion. So physical pendulum is basically a rigid body of any shape. This is a rigid body of any shape and size. in a vertical situation like this where it is hinged at a point like this suppose it is hinged at a point p and in the equilibrium condition its center of mass c is just vertically below so it can rotate freely about hinge p okay so this rigid body is hinged at the point p such that it can rotate freely about a horizontal axis through the point P perpendicular to the plane of the diagram. And C is the center of mass. The body okay and we will also use the term ip over here which will be moment of inertia about the axis at p and of course mass of the body is m so we will see that when such a, a, a system is given angular displacement from this mean position it will perform angular harmonic motion so right now what is happening the weight vector is acting through this point p so the torque because of it is zero so this is the equilibrium position when this line pc is vertical then the torque due to mg zero so it is the equilibrium or mean position but you realize that the moment we give it some angular displacement on either side clockwise or anti-clockwise the mg will develop a momentum with respect to that axis at p such that the torque will become opposite in sense to the angular displacement that means if i give it a anti-clockwise rotation of theta the torque will be clockwise. If I give it a clockwise rotation of theta, the torque will be anti-clockwise. So it will be a restorative torque that Mg produces. So that is the condition for any oscillation. Any angular oscillation requires an equilibrium position, a stable equilibrium position, and a restorative torque when you take the system away from that stable equilibrium. However, for it to ang be angular harmonic motion, not just an oscillation, but a harmonic motion, we require the condition that that torque should not only be restorative, but it should be proportionate to theta. That is, it should be proportionate to the displacement from mean position, angular displacement. Okay. So just make a note of this uh, diagram and understand the equilibrium position. Next, we will see that when we give it a small rotation about the point P, so that line PC is now becoming at some angle to the vertical. So if we give it a theta, which is anti-clockwise, the torque that MG will develop will be clockwise and vice versa. So next, we will show that that torque is what is capable of creating the SHM or the angular harmonic condition provided theta is a small angle.
Okay, so people, now we can see that if we give such a pendulum an angular displacement, so you know that line PC has been shifted from here to this position. Center of mass is here because the whole thing, the whole rigid body has been rotated about the point P through an angular displacement theta. So we'll see now that this, the weight vector, it now has a moment arm and it's create, going to create a torque, which is like this. It's going to create a restorative torque. So at angular displacement, theta, there is a restorative torque tau okay due to mg about that point p so how do we calculate the torque so for that we need this moment arm here this is the moment arm okay so if the distance pc is d if pc is the distance d then we can see that this torque this equation will become mg multiplied by the moment arm, which is d sine theta. Okay. This moment arm you can see here, calling them x, suppose. So x is equal to d sine theta. So that is the moment arm for mg with respect to the axis at p. So that becomes moment of inertia alpha, where alpha is minus of d2 theta by dt square because it's opposite in sense. So now I have the relation from here that alpha which is minus d2 theta by dt square is mg d sine theta divided by moment of inertia about the point, this relation. Now, for small angular displacement, you know that sine theta is approximately equal to theta. For small angle, you have that, consider a small angle, theta is small then the arc length is more or less equal to the perpendicular and the base is more or less equal to the radius hypotenuse. So sine theta and tan theta become approximately theta, whereas cos theta is approximately one. This is small angle approximations. So using that, so we have the relation that d2 theta by dt square is equal to minus mgd divided by moment of inertia about p into theta. So this is the angular harmonic equation. This is the dynamical condition for angular harmonic motion. Short, we just call it angular SHL.
Excuse me. Yes, you can. I'll show that. So also, now to conclude this part, you can see from here, we get the value of omega in terms of these things. That is MGD divided by moment of inertia. So from this, so time period of SHM, is now given by this like a direct formula. So we just need to understand what is the value of D and what is the value of IP for any given pendulum. Okay, so Shikhar, if you finished writing down this part, then I can take an example of a actual physical pendulum now. So as our first example, okay, very good. So as our first example, we will look at Something very basic, a thin uniform rod of mass M and length L. Mass M length L, which is, which has a hinge at the point P about which it can rotate. Hinged at P. So we want to find the time period for it's angular SHM about the axis P, okay. So we don't need to do the derivation again over here, but we can just see that if you're at an angular position theta from the vertical position where it is in equilibrium, then the weight acting through the center of mass so this distance will be L by 2. Okay, so at an angular position theta, this mg will have a moment arm x of L by 2 sin theta. So when we take that net torque is equal to I alpha, we'll have the relation that mg L by 2 sin theta is equal to ml square by 3 alpha. So the angular acceleration alpha, as you can see, will become three by two g sine theta by L. And now we apply the small angle approximation. Okay. So now alpha is minus d2 theta by dt square. This opposite in sense, you can see that this producing a torque. It's going to create an alpha like this, okay. And sine theta will be approximated for theta for small angle. So d2 theta by dt square becoming minus 3g by 2l theta. So your omega square, which was basically what it was, mgd divided by ip, basically mg l by 2 divided by ml square by 3 if you go by the formula based method so you can see that this so the time period and this So if you take a thin uniform rod of length L and you hinge it at the topmost point and you give it a small angular displacement of five degrees or less and release it, it will perform this kind of angular oscillation with a time period which will be this. And that angular oscillation will be harmonic in nature. That is theta will be a harmonic function of time. So hope this example is clear. Now you can also take the case of the simple pendulum as a special case of this. So simple pendulum, we'll discuss it in more detail in the next lecture. 
but a simple, simple pendulum actually just consists of a massless thread and a bob for the simple pendulum the distance d of the center of mass from the point of suspension that actually becomes the length of the thread okay. and the moment of inertia about the point of suspension it becomes ml square because it's just a particle So it's omega square, which is basically mgd divided by ip is g by l, and therefore its time period. That standard formula that you know, two pi under root l by g. We just think of it like a very simple and special case of a physical pendulum, where instead of a rigid body, you actually just have a single particle of mass m attached to a massless thread. Okay, so we'll just treat the simple pendulum as a special case of physical pendulum. That's how we derive the formula for time period. So with this, uh, you should be able to solve uh, entire H.C. Verma chapter of uh, simple harmonic motion. Okay, I mean, we are done with the theory. So next lecture, we will see some uh, problem solving and also some doubt solving from questions from H.C. Verma in your module. So that's it for today's session, people. Wish you all the best. We are now coming towards the end of simple harmonic motion chapter.